This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. Visit the link in the description below to sign up for their daily newsletter today. There's a new unconventional tactic being used by the Federal Reserve and many other central banks around the world to help rein in inflation. And no one really knows how exactly it's going to work. Quantitative tightening, or QT as it's called, is a contractionary monetary policy that, just like interest rate hikes, is being implemented by the Federal Reserve to help fight off price inflation. At a high level, it really is just the reversal of the stimulus that the central bank enacted following the financial crisis in 2008 and the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. And as the measure tightens capital markets, it should alleviate some inflationary pressures. Given all the record-breaking inflation rates that we've been seeing in the news lately, that's probably pretty encouraging to hear. But there's just one problem. QT at this scale has never really been successfully done before. And given that this is a contractionary policy, that is, it will contract money supply and apply downwards pressure on demand, it could prove an incredibly dangerous policy to financial markets, which has gotten a lot of investors nervous. After all, the last time the United States tried to carry out QT in 2018, it led to a pretty negative reaction from the markets and more or less forced the Federal Reserve to put off the policy. So what exactly is QT? How does it work? And why does it have investors so jittery? Well, we'll answer those questions and more on today's Plain Bagel. To understand quantitative tightening, we first need to give a bit of an explanation around quantitative easing, because like I mentioned, QT is really just the reversal of QE. I'll leave a link in the description below to a video explaining more about QE, but at a high level, quantitative easing is when the central bank creates money digitally and then uses that new money to buy assets, typically government bonds, on the open market. By inserting itself into the market as a buyer, the central bank causes a sort of domino effect in the financial markets. Buying these assets will replace them with new money and increase the price of bonds as their scarcity rises. With more liquidity and lower bond yields as a result of that rising bond price, the cost of new debt should go down given this falling market rate. And lending activity should increase as demand for loans rises given the lower cost, and banks hopefully choose to lend more money, which overall should boost economic activity. In other words, QE tries to lower market interest rates to ease financial markets. And while it usually focuses on purchasing treasuries, the program was extended in the US to include mortgage-backed securities as well as corporate bonds. QE was first implemented in the US following the 2008 financial crisis to help support capital markets at a time where liquidity was really scarce, businesses were desperate for cash, and the central bank had already exhausted most of its interest rate cuts. But the program continued into the pandemic as markets once again faced a threat with their stability. In fact, over the last few years alone, the Federal Reserve has bought $3.3 trillion worth in treasuries and $1.3 trillion in mortgage-backed securities. And at the time of recording, they have accumulated just under $9 trillion worth of assets on their balance sheet. Now, as helpful as QE was in supporting the markets through these two financial crises, it has started to show one of its painful side effects, inflation. QE is by no means the only contributor to inflation that we're seeing, and it's kind of foolish to pretend like supply chain kinks and the pandemic don't play a role here. And QE isn't the money printing most people describe it as, since it creates bank reserves and not cash like you or I might use to purchase assets. But higher lending activity, supported by QE, did contribute to rising money supply which can still translate into rising prices for goods and services. Which is why, with some areas of the economy now more stabilized than early on in the pandemic, the central bank is looking to unwind its balance sheet, aka it will begin pursuing quantitative tightening. Whereas QE involves the central bank creating more money, QT involves the bank taking that money back out and sort of destroying it. This can be done by the bank selling its assets back into the market, but in most cases, central banks will look to actually carry out passive QT, where they essentially do nothing. As in, they just let their assets that they have, which are all debt-based securities, mature. When these treasury bonds, mortgages, and corporate bonds come due, the borrowers will pay the face value of the securities back to the central bank, which by itself will lead the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to shrink. Hmm. Now, the Federal Reserve is expected to continue rolling some of this money back into new maturities, but overall their balance sheet should decline as they reinvest less and less of their money back into the economy. As for how this will actually impact the economy, well, it's not fully known, but we do have some ideas. For one, it is expected to help with inflation as QT reduces liquidity. The Federal Reserve is after all taking money out of the system as if pulling it through a portal to a different dimension 
which in turn should increase the cost of capital and thereby reduce the actual demand for said capital, which given that inflation is often defined as too much money chasing too few goods, should help curb rising prices. QT will also likely increase fixed income yields. Whether the Federal Reserve sells or simply lets its assets mature, bonds can no longer rely on the central bank supporting its market demand, which could lead prices to fall in yields, the amount pays relative to its price, to rise. This is part of the reason QT is able to influence longer term market rates in the economy. Whereas central bank rate hikes and cuts do do a good job of controlling short term loans, there's no explicit rate for hiking or cutting when it comes to longer term loans. So while rate hikes will eventually influence longer term rates as they sort of make their way through the system, QT could cause a more immediate impact for that area as longer term debt instruments see lower demand. Now, if rising rates and shrinking demand all sound like negatives to you, it's because it kind of is, that's actually the point. QT is a contractionary policy to cool off the economy, but it's sort of a necessity to prevent further pain from inflation. You think of it as like trying to wean a patient off of a drug that, while helpful while they were sick, is addictive and comes with side effects. The idea is that now that the patient is hopefully healthier, they can survive without the drug and won't need to suffer its consequences. And with the economy, the hope is that we've gone through the worst of the financial crisis and the pandemic, knock on wood, and that we can now ease our way off of it to avoid high inflation. But in the same way that quitting something cold turkey can lead to severe and at times deadly withdrawal symptoms for those who have become dependent on a drug, QT can be dangerous. And there are a number of factors that have investors and economists alike concerned. For one, the economy is far from being in tip top shape. COVID, supply chain kinks, and the war in Ukraine all present pretty severe exogenous challenges to the economy. And just this past quarter, the US reported its first contraction in GDP since the beginning of the pandemic, which is half of the way towards a technical recession. QE and low interest rates have also resulted in record debt levels for a lot of countries, as consumers, businesses, and governments took advantage and unfortunately may have become dependent on cheap debt. So as rates rise, these parties will see heightened costs and could suffer as a result as they try to cope with their large debt loads. Finally, there's a risk of a sell-off in the markets. The last and really only other time the Federal Reserve tried to shrink its balance sheet, being one of the only central banks to ever really do so, the S&P 500 dropped nearly 18% from its high in 2018. Not only because investors were nervous about how contractionary policies would influence the economy, but because QE is actually thought to have inflated prices for financial assets in addition to prices for goods and services. You see, with low fixed income yields and more money floating around in the system, stocks, and yes, perhaps even crypto, likely saw higher demand as investors and institutions look to earn a return with their newfound liquidity. Now that the Federal Reserve is reducing that liquidity, this surplus of money might flow out of stocks, which would help explain the 2018 drop that we saw, and may now be a contributor to the more recent sell-off, given the Federal Reserve's announcements around this new QT program. And that's all assuming the Federal Reserve simply stops purchasing more assets. Some economists are concerned that we may see them need to actively sell longer term assets that would take longer to roll off by themselves if inflation doesn't respond to their initial progress. Something that could drastically impact the markets further as the world's single largest buyer of bond securities would suddenly become its single largest seller. And all this is compounded by the fact that we've never really done this before. Central bankers do not know what the right amount of QT will be. And in the same way that quantitative easing was largely experimental, so too will be reversing this large buying program. It's easy to see why it's gotten some people jittery. Not only are we dealing with the offloading of trillions of dollars worth of securities onto the economy, but we don't have any real historical precedent to guide us through it. And no one knows how moderate or severe the market response will be. But as real as the risk of QT is to the markets, it's not a reason to lose all hope and look into moving into the metaverse so you can wait for the uncertainty to roll over. QT may cause a recession. It may not. And no one can predict the future. But there are at the very least some factors that suggest that we are better prepared to handle QT now than we were in the past. For one, despite high debt loads and supply chain kinks, the economy is, in other ways, better off than when QE started. 
even in comparison to 2018, when QT was last attempted, it's believed there is a lot more liquidity in the system to support markets as money is taken out of the system. QT will also be likely done in smaller chunks than QE and has more time to be enacted, given that QE was at times done more rapidly to respond to acute shocks to the system. Some are expecting the Fed's balance sheet to shrink by more than $1 trillion over the next 12 month period, but that's a heck of a lot less than the balance sheet growth we saw during the onset of the pandemic. QT will also likely be dynamic. In the same way it was stopped abruptly the first time around, the Federal Reserve can adjust or change course with this new program as it monitors how markets are reacting. It's not to say that we won't see a negative response and that that won't take time, but it is to say that the Fed probably won't continue pursuing it if it's causing severe consequences. So yes, QT is a reason for caution, but not for panic. And as with past interest rate hike cycles, markets will recover and adapt. The risks of a recession and a market decline are higher with QT, but in the short term, it's near impossible to predict what will happen. And you should ignore anyone that's claiming that a doomsday is upon us. The people who say that have been saying so over the past decade. There's also the chance that markets have already priced in this sort of information, so you should be careful there as well. Still, it is worth being aware of the situation and understanding what exactly it means when the Federal Reserve says that it will unwind its balance sheet. While it's not likely something that you'd experience firsthand as an average Joe, it could still have a far-reaching impact on your day-to-day -day life and your investment portfolio. A big thank you to Morning Brew for sponsoring this video. With all the important economic updates coming out on inflation, supply chain kinks, and QT, which now you'll hopefully have a better understanding of next time you stumble upon the term, they can be difficult to stay afloat on all the news. And it's why I think there's a lot of value in The Morning Brew. The Morning Brew is an awesome newsletter that sends out content seven days a week, summarizing tech, finance, and business news. They are a five minute light read that bring you up to speed on important and interesting headlines. For example, one of the recent issues touched on insider trading on NFT marketplaces and how a former head of OpenSea was recently charged for buying certain <laughs> NFTs, featuring them on the site's homepage, and then selling the hyped up pieces for a big profit. As you can see, they cover pretty interesting finance stories. But a great thing too about The Morning Brew is that they managed to strike a great balance between informative and entertaining. You might not be laughing at updates around high inflation rates, but at least you won't find the process of learning about it boring with their witty commentary. I highly suggest you check them out using the link in the description below. It takes just a few seconds and they're completely free. So be sure to check out Morning Brew. Thanks for watching. I hope this video cleared up a few things about QT for you. If it did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about the economy and QT. Does it have you worried, or are you just assuming that long term things will be okay? As most people should hopefully be thinking. Thanks for joining me today. We'll see you in the next one.